Elie Wiesel, Zichron Libracha, may his memory be a blessing, offered a parable for our times. Man complained to God, You have no idea how hard it is to be human, to live a life darkened by suffering and despair in a world filled with violence and destruction, to fear death and to worry nothing we do will create or dream or matter. God, you have no idea how hard it is to be human. God responded, You think it's easy being God? I have a whole universe to run. A whole universe demanding constant vigilance. You think you could do that? I'll tell you what, suggested the man. Let's switch places. Let's switch places just for a moment. For just a moment, you be man, and I'll be God. And that way we'll see who has it harder. Just for a moment, God answered. Agreed. So man and God switched places. Man sat upon God's throne, and God descended to the earth. After a moment passed, God looked up and said, No, okay, time to switch back. But man refused. Man refused to give up the throne of God. This is our world, where man plays God, and God is in exile. This past summer, I read Yuval Hariri's, Noah Hariri's book, A Brief History of Tomorrow. In it, Hariri makes the provocative statement that humanity has finally solved the three fundamental problems that have stalked human existence since the dawn of time. Famine, plague, and war. It used to be that we attributed these horrible events to God being angry with us. Crops died, people got sick, cities and civilizations were laid to ruin, and it was God's divine wrath. But now we're smarter. Now we're more scientific. Now we're more sophisticated. We don't look to God's will to explain our fate anymore. We look out upon a reality shaped by politics and economics, a reality shaped by our own choices. Harari explains that science and technology have given us the godlike power to feed the world and thus end hunger. Medicine can contain, and in many cases, treat and cure plagues that used to kill tens of millions of people. And our military prowess, our massive weapon systems, and our mutually assured destruction, they have made war on a global scale obsolete. God has been dethroned. And for better or worse, we now control things. We sit upon God's iron throne. It's a Game of Thrones reference for those following along. We look out over our kingdom, upon our technology, our advancements, and full of pride we proclaim, who needs God? In the kingdom where man plays God, and God is in exile, we can have air conditioning and ignore global warming. We can keep adding cars and condos, and our brilliance in civil engineering will magically accommodate all of them. We can strip money from public education and still somehow expect to raise the next generation of Nobel-worthy scholars, as well as countless teachers and doctors and engineers and philosophers that we will need to make a civil society function. We can place unchecked power in our elected officials and then elect celebrities and extremists to govern. Rabbi Harold Kushner argues that it is easy to dismiss religion as the residue of childish dependency and medieval ignorance. But if we do that, who will teach us to shudder? Who will tell the difference and how will we tell the difference? between sacred and trivial. If we have no ideal, where will we get our ideals? Maybe the idea of God controlling every detail of the universe was just a myth developed ages ago to explain the seemingly uncontrollable events of our natural world. In many ways, I believe that. The God that I believe in has never been a God that brings floods to punish 
or helps conquer evil in times of war. My God is not a puppet master. But the myth was helpful. The image, the image was comforting because at its core was a God that held humanity as sacred, that loved human beings, so much so that like a parent, sometimes that God of myth would punish us to teach us a lesson. Avinu Malkenu, we say, our father, our king. The ancients could count on God loving them, like a parent loves their children. So what can we count on now? If we have no faith in a God of myth, do we place our faith in human beings? For all the bad press that religion has gotten, for all the wars that have been fought in its name, religion asks a question that science ignores. Today, sitting here, in this sanctuary, in this place, amongst these people, surrounded by prayer and tradition and Torah, we ask that question. If you don't believe in God, then what do you believe in? What is sacred in your life? Rabbi Ed Feinstein, a friend and colleague, offers this definition. He writes that the sacred is that which we serve with love and loyalty. The sacred is the core value upon which we build a life, the ideals which inform a life lived with purpose. The sacred lifts us up above the ego, above the endless desires and the drives of the narrower self to reach for something bigger, something truer, a more generous self. The sacred is what you live for. It is what, God forbid, you would die to defend. And the sacred is what is missing in our politics and in our families and in our world today. Modernity, science, technology, the internet, they are all there to liberate us from repression, from superstition and authority. But in the process, those same forces have subverted all that is sacred, all that we believe in. And so many of us believe in nothing. Martin Luther King once observed, if you don't know what you're willing to die for, then you don't know what you're living for. Love of country, is that sacred? Our politics have become so corrosive and so stridently partisan and not just here in Canada, where I will grant you, we are better than most. But ask yourself, will we be able to avoid the divisiveness that is just south of our borders in our next election cycle? Fidelity to religion? Judaism? Is that sacred? If our politics are divided, our Jewish tent is equally divided, maybe more so. The only place that Jews cannot openly pray, openly pray in the manner that they choose, is guess where? Israel. Who is a Jew has become what is a Jew? Sacredness of family. Once upon a time, we saw family as sacred. But research at the University of Michigan found that North American children today spend about 20 hours a week interacting with their parents and 30 hours or more a week outside of school in front of a TV screen or a cell phone. When you check your cell phone before you check in with the person sleeping next to you, or your child running up to you, something is broken. al Shechatani, I have done that myself. So what is sacred to you? What is your core value? What is your purpose? Why are you alive? We are dying every single day of our lives. What are you living for? I'll tell you what I see. I see people so hungry today for meaning, for the sacred, that they embrace all sorts of beliefs and systems. It was once imagined that as science progressed, all closed systems of belief would disappear in the face of scientific skepticism. 
but the opposite has occurred. Modernity has progressed. Fundamentalism has thrived. No matter how irrational, intolerant, authoritarian, people run to embrace fundamentalism because it fills the deep hunger for the sacred. I won't list the examples. They are on the news every day. They are on Twitter Twitter, thousand times a day. We know them. We're troubled by them. But we can't turn away from them because lacking faith in something greater, we place faith in something that appears to be great. When you pursue the sacred, you have questions. You have doubts. You are in service of a higher ideal. You're trying to live up to God, not trying to be God. The fundamentalist, seated upon God's throne, has no doubts. The fundamentalist has certainty, has absolute truth. Even if the fundamentalist is sexist, chauvinistic, domineering, abusive, even if the ideology is primitive and prejudiced, at least the fundamentalist believes without qualification or condition. And that provides a kind of security Standing in the presence of unqualified faith, we are granted a momentary reprieve from the spiritual emptiness of modern life. Many people find that compelling, but it's false. Why then are strong man leaders in ascent around the globe? Because when nothing is sacred, we practice idolatry and we build the faux sacred out of loud and shiny things, promising to make things great again. Fundamentalism today is growing because the human soul craves the sacred and it cannot find it. It craves it even if it is twisted. And if we can find nothing sacred, nothing to serve, we live with a hole in our soul. And that hole, it hurts. And so we run to fill that hole with something to numb the pain. Drink and drugs, shopping and acquisition, sex and pornography, exercise, fantasy, food, obsessive work, and the fetishizing of leaders who promise to make things great again. Karl Marx once condemned religion as the opiate of the people, but it's the other way around. Today, opiates in their many forms are the religion of the people. Addiction fills the hole where the sacred once lived. When I served as a rabbi in Los Angeles, my congregation was just up the street from that of Rabbi Harold Shulweis, the Ikron Nivracha. Rabbi Shulweis, who died four years ago, this December, was one of the great theologians of our time. It was a privilege to sit in his synagogue and learn from his words and drink in Torah at his feet. He taught a theology of godliness, struggling as we all do to find God in the ashes of the Shoah of the Holocaust. Schulweis argued that if we can no longer find the tradition's sacred values in an old and seemingly irrelevant narrative about God, then we should turn the process around and root a new narrative of God in our sacred values. The goal of Judaism, he argued, is not to make us believers in a God above, It never was. The goal of Judaism is to make us vessels of divine, divine holiness here on earth. It's not about God. It's about godliness. Godliness is what you do, not what you pray to. I've shared this teaching with you before. In the 12-step world of addiction and recovery, they teach that God, G-O-D, is an acronym for good orderly direction. God is the path toward, the path toward the sacred, a lifetime of steps. This idea has been in Jewish tradition from the beginning. Don't discount yourselves as Reformed Jews. Don't buy into the narrative that we are remaking Judaism on our own terms, that somehow we're less kosher. Open up Maimonides, the greatest book of Jewish philosophy ever written, the majestic guide to the perplexed. It begins with the same dilemma that we are all struggling with. Where do you find the sacred in the modern and the mundane? 
How do you make sense out of a world that at once is spinning out of control and at the same time feels like it's entirely within our control through science and technology? In the 12th century, Maimonides set about developing a radical new idea of God and religion. The ultimate goal of human life, he taught, is to perfect oneself so that one can know God. His model for this was Moses. Moses was the the, the perfect example. Because he realized that in Moses' ascent up Mount Sinai, it was a metaphor for the journey of human perfection. But one important fact of Moses' story troubled Maimonides. Having achieved perfection and standing as Moses did face to face, panim al panim with God, Moses turns around. Moses comes back down off the mountain. He doesn't stay there up with God. He comes back down and he returns to his people and all of their troubles and sores. Why doesn't Moses stay on the mountaintop with God? Why doesn't he sit on the iron throne? Only on the very last page, the very last paragraph of the Guide to Perplexed, to the Perplexed, does Maimonides give his answer. The perf- this is what he writes. The perfection in which man can truly glory is attained by him when he has acquired knowledge of God and God's wisdom. Having acquired this knowledge one will then be determined always to seek kindness, justice, and righteousness, and to imitate the ways of God. Do you hear that? Achieving intellectual perfection, knowing God is not the ultimate objective. The real goal of human life is to embody God's justice and loving kindness in the world, to live God, to do God and godliness. The last line of Maimonides is the first line of Schulweis. The pursuit and the stewardship of the sacred is what godliness is. It is the goal of humanity. It's the purpose for our existence. In your hearts you know this. Again, Rabbi Feinstein, this friend of mine, he was sharing this in a sermon that served as the basis and the framework for my own. And he gave this incredible example. He explained that the fundamental building block of Jewish prayer is the bracha. And you know this, Baruch HaTah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Every bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah boy or girl knows that. If you've been to a Seder, you know that. But if the purpose of faith is to express belief in the God above, then the bracha should be enough. You should just stop there. Baruch HaTah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, you're done. That says it all. Praised are you, Adonai, our God, rule of the universe, period. Why say anything else? It's just about Praise. But Rabbi Feinstein points out insightfully that we don't stop there. Because Judaism doesn't stop with praise. Because the sacred is not in praising, it is in doing. And so we continue. Hamotzi lechemin ha'aretz, who brings forth bread from the earth. Borei pri hagafen, who brings forth the fruit from the vine. Shehechianu v'kiamanu v'higianu lazman hazet, who has given us life and sustained us, enabling us to arrive at this joyous occasion. The real purpose of the bracha is to build a vocabulary of sacred values, to identify what is sacred in life, and then seat it as if we are on God's throne, to act with godliness in pursuit and defense of the sacred things in our life and our society. So how do we do that at Temple Shalom? How do we do that here? How do we walk the walk? How are we pursuing the sacred in our lives? Pursuit of the sacred is why we sponsor two Kurdish Syrian refugee families. Pursuit of the sacred is why we stand on the front lines in defense of women's rights and gay rights and human rights in Vancouver, in Canada, and Israel, and around the world. Pursuit of the sacred is why we need that new machsor, so that the words of the page match the words in our hearts, filling the whole in our soul. Pursuit of the sacred is why this temple, Temple Shalom, led by the heroic work of Rabbi Bregman and Kathy Bregman and Jordana Bregman and the whole team at Hill LBC is the first to stand beside them as they fight BDS on campus and work to build bridges of dialogue where others would put up walls. Pursuit of the sacred is why in this new year Temple Shalom will join with other faith and labor-based organizations in the Metro Vancouver Alliance to effect real change at a local level 
and our city's politics and priorities. You'll hear more about that. This congregation as a whole, and each of you, through your sadaka, you devote time and resources to our 60-plus group, to our sisterhood, our men's club, our religious school, our East Side Jews, our Jewish information class, our temple teens, and next generation. Because those populations and many more within our community, they are sacred. They are an expression of what we live for and what really matters. What is sacred? Sacred is what we do. Faith is only real when it is translated into action. We must continue to do all of those great things that we are doing, both as individuals and as a congregation. And we also must do the most important and maybe the most difficult thing of all. In this new year, let us remove God from exile and bring the sacred into our daily lives. In this new year, let us translate our faith into actions that truly reflect our beliefs. Kenny Hiratsome, may it be God's will. Amen.